real honor for me to be here. I also want to briefly introduce my colleague Paul Mason, who will be joining me in this. Paul's uh, a South African who has spent some years in Australia uh, and has been part of a lot of exciting campaigning of this variety and, and other types uh, there as well. Um, so I wanted to, the, the topic for today's conversation, can online uh, activism change the world? Uh, I'll start off by giving you uh, a quick um, run through on my background just to augment what Sean said and then begin the conversation. I want to make this as um, kind of interactive as possible to, to, to really get at what you guys are, are interested in. Um, so I have worked both uh, inside and outside uh, elections on, on issue advocacy and independent organizations. I was, uh, I've been on a few presidential campaigns in the United States um, and managed Barack Obama's volunteer uh, engagement for the first year of his administration. Uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through a story of what we, we did there uh, to pass health reform. Uh, as Sean mentioned, I helped start Avaz and I've been on the board of that uh, since it began and I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, I also began with a group called MoveOn.org in the United States, which engages on a whole range of issues, anti-war issues and peace and justice issues, economic equality issues. Uh, has about seven million members now across the country um, and uh, is, is defined by moving very quickly when there are opportunities for those members to act in, uh, in ways together that will change the outcome or move an issue forward that they care about. And I've helped bring that model or, or elements, core elements of that model in, into being in a variety of different countries. Uh, UK, a group called 38 Degrees, which now has about 1.2 million members in the UK. It has led some very powerful campaigning on protecting uh, public ownership of things like the forests and the national health care system there. Uh, I've worked with a group in Australia that Paul will talk a little bit more about called Get Up that uses a similar model and uh, I've helped start similar initiatives in Canada and uh, New Zealand and I currently live in Bangalore doing that with uh, a group in India. So that's uh, my background and I, I give you all of that to give you a sense of where I'm coming from in talking to you today and also if any of that brings up questions that you want to address, uh, we, we can do that. Um, but I want to start by asking, um, when, when I throw out the term online organizing, uh, what, is that, what does that mean to, to folks here? Does anybody want to just throw out some ideas about what, what is online organizing? We're going to talk about it, so there must be some theory about what it is. <laughs> Obviously nothing polished, just rough basic thoughts. I just want to get a sense of where folks are at with this. Go ahead, John. Email lists, getting people on email lists. Mm. So that's part of it, yeah. That's often part of it, anyway. Yeah? Getting people to do things or support something without necessarily standing personally in their living room and talking to them. Ah, okay. Getting people to do things remotely when you're not necessarily face to face with them. Cool, I like that definition a lot. Nurturing, Any other thoughts? Nurturing like an alternative public sphere where people are able to discuss and deepen conversations can't ordinarily happen. Yeah, okay, great. Conversations that can be facilitated in a new way that wouldn't otherwise have a place to occur. Yeah, great. These are really good answers. Any other thoughts? Zachy, why don't you pick on someone if you should? Three in a row. Jatuzo. Someza. Akkodile. And Dali. <laughs> Is it three in a row? Four. <laughs> I can't count. Go ahead. Chosen victims. Uh, forming people, uh, specific problems or issues, you know, bringing awareness basically. Okay. Mobilizing. What is mobilizing? Kind of like, like, I don't want to say mobilizing people to talk on an issue, like using the electronics, I guess. Using what? Well, well, if there's a problem, like now with the police, kind of mm. use that to get everyone involved talking on it using technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, <laughs> it's basically using the internet to get people involved in a certain issue and try and <clears throat> make them aware and educate them about that particular issue. Very good. Got it. So it's everything that they've said, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just 
to specifically speaking to petitions to the ability for people to actually sign on to what was previously a very paper-based thing um, and put their names next to a course if they feel strong. Great, wonderful. These are fantastic answers. Thank you. Um, so things you've heard, uh, getting people to uh, communicating with people and, and facilitating them to take action across distance to have conversations they wouldn't otherwise be able to have. Uh, you would be able to have using email to reach out to people, using the internet to uh, reach out to people, uh, getting people to speak up on issues. Uh, really good responses. I would say that you know online organizing is fundamentally just about using um, digital tools, digital communication tools, to put information and, into people's hands about a situation, uh, an issue that they care about, and also facilitating their ability to take some sort of action uh, collectively to influence the outcome of, of something they care about. So it's information and action facilitated through digital tools. Now, one of the big points I want to make here is that I think that while digital tools are important, and increasingly so in reaching people at scale uh, in modern times, that uh, online organizing isn't fundamentally about those digital tools. It's about the same kind of organizing and theories of change uh, that have always been at the core, it, when it's done well, it's about the same theories of change and theories of organizing that have always been at the core of how great change has happened. Um, what I want to do is try to illustrate this by telling a few stories about moments of, of online organizing. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that, and then Paul will tell some stories from Australia. But before I do that, I'd also like to just pose one more question to, to you folks. What are some of the uh, downsides, potential downsides, of online organizing in, in your head? Like what, what are some worries you might have about it, uh, critiques you've heard or have or wonder about uh, that might be a disadvantage of trying to use digital tools uh, for organizing? doesn't really bring people out onto the streets for major issues and you know, like I said, a little side point of that is often when things are attributed to online organizing, it's, it's, it's hard to know, you know, what the, you know, if, if it was actually that, you know, a lot of people would talk a lot about the Arab Spring, but there were a lot of elements before that that were in place that you know, made it easy for online organizing to to be impactful in that situation, but even then is, you know, potentially overhyped. So it's like easy to hype yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy to hype, certainly. Uh, easy to hype and doesn't bring people offline. Yeah. I'll just add to that though, it's, 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 you might even get people to feel that they're active merely by, say, liking your page or something. Right. And, and feel that their job is done and, and not taking any real action. Yeah. yeah, slacktivism is a term that gets used a lot. Clicktivism. Um, have people heard those terms at all? Familiar with idea? It's basically like, if it makes activism so easy that all you need to do is click a button, then maybe uh, it takes people who maybe would otherwise do more, but they're convinced that all they need to do is click a link, and then they're done, and, uh, and it's actually a, a, a net negative. That's a critique that some people have. I don't share that critique, but I do share the fear that's behind it. I, I, I think the analysis that the, leads us to wonder, are we getting the most out of people, uh, is, is quite right. And, and we'll, we'll dig into that together. Anything else? Access. Yeah. Go, go ahead, you and, and you, yeah. Access. Yeah, access. So who, which voices are we hearing? Mm, mm, um, that's a great one. And security as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Access, security, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. No, but just maybe uh, people really engaging with what's out there. Like if, for instance, there's an article in the past, do pe re people really mm -hmm. engage with it all? Really they yeah. just see that there's an article. So I still feel that face-to-face -face has a different impact to that. Right. Not that it's wrong, but there's Absolutely. also that element. Do people, are, are they really aware? Or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Just how much like attention, how much like real energy can you get through it through a digital medium as opposed to a face-to-face -face encounter? Yeah, yeah, great. Yes. Uh, also, confusion of whether like uh, online uh, online uh, uh, things such as Facebook and stuff, whether they are actually um, a resource to actually. To push for an agenda or 
are they are the actual uh, events which take place when you push for an agenda. Basically, I'm trying to talk about the Arab Spring where people saw it as like a Facebook revolution. Well, Facebook was used as a tool to actually, as another resource to actually uh, push or to actually mobilize people, to get people informed and to actually inform the world of what is really happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. I mean, I think also the point from as I made, it also speaks to um, the, the quality of debates that we get online yeah. um, compared to like face to face. I mean, you can't put your point across in 140 characters on Twitter as much as you would um, when you're with that person discussing the issue. Yeah, 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 totally. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. So, I'll tell a couple of stories. I guess the, the main point I want to make right off the bat is that to my mind, one of the kind of quirks of our time is that these terms like online organizing or digital organizing uh, have, have gained a certain currency because the tools themselves are new and they have a big impact on society in a lot of ways and people using them in, in this regard have a certain brand or, or, or certain, uh, there, there's a certain visibility to it. But I really think it's all, it's all a misnomer. I think that digital tools are increasingly just the way that we communicate with each other on an individual level and a social level. But that organizers throughout history have used the tools that were available to people to communicate with each other to do the two things that I mentioned are at the core of online organizing. Provide information and facilitate taking action. Uh, if you go back through American history, which is the history I'm most familiar with being from America, uh, does anybody know the name Paul Revere? Uh, ring any bells? He was a guy in, in the American Revolution. Uh, he was very famous for riding around and uh, declaring that the British were coming. I think he was the odd man right with the cap of cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you think of the Marlboro Man. <laughs> Slightly different. Another important figure in American history. Uh, uh, he, he rode around on, on horseback. Uh, letting the colonists know that the, that the British fleet was coming to invade Boston. So they were able to arm themselves and defend themselves when the colonial army arrived in one of the first battles of the Revolutionary War. And we don't look back on that traditionally and describe Paul Revere as a horseback organizer. And uh, the, the, he was all about using horses. It's just because we knew that that's how he moved quickly from one place to another. At the time, the fastest way to spread information was to jump on a horse and yell and, and ride very quickly and say, the British are coming. If he could have tweeted, hashtag the British are coming, <laughs> and had a lot of people following his hashtag, I'm pretty sure he would have done that. You know, similarly, uh, there's a guy named Thomas Paine. If you've never had a chance to read a small pamphlet he wrote called Common Sense, it's really worth reading. One of the most popular pamphlets in those early days that inspired a lot of the uh, re revolting against the British Empire in the American colonies. People don't look back at him and call him a pamphlet organizer. Uh, because at the time, the obvious way, if you had an idea that you wanted to get across and engage people with, was to put it in a pamphlet and print it on a printing press and hand it out in the town square. He was a writer. He was a thinker. He was an organizer. Paul Revere was a rabble-rouser. The tools that they used didn't define them. I think in coming years, when as digital tools become more and more native to how we communicate, how we engage with each other, this whole concept of online organizing will, will disappear as well. And we'll just think about it as how are people using the ways that we communicate with each other uh, to best engage and mobilize. But I'll illustrate that even further with a couple of other stories and also try to tie it into uh, the American Civil Rights Movement. So I want to start, there are, you know, infinite number of stories that one could tell about online organizing, how, how these tools have been used in various different moments. There's one that I used in an article I wrote uh, about this topic a few years ago that I also wanted to introduce here because there's some thematic relevance to some things you folks have been facing here. I'll start just by playing this quick clip. They weren't today. They are outraged and they are calling for justice because of this video of an officer arresting a teenager last week. It's a video that Eyewitness News first showed you. Darla Miles is live in Newark with what the protesters are demanding. Darla? Diana, we're talking about a 15-year-old who attends a school for gifted students. During this incident, his dreadlocks were ripped out of his scalp. He was charged, however, with assaulting an officer and resisting arrest. But the community here says the police have it backwards, and they want the four officers involved in this incident fired. 
From high school student to political activist, 15 year old Travis for Trey passes out t shirts that bear his face and his name. They read, I am Travis. Why me? It doesn't make any sense for police brutality to continue, and there's nothing to be done about it. I'll pause it there. Uh, familiar theme? Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys can relate to that? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, this was in a town in New Jersey, that uh, Newark, New Jersey, that is 80% black and Hispanic. Uh, one, of the, one of the highest concentration of minorities, obviously, in that city, majority uh, uh, black and Hispanic citizens in the, in the country. And these kinds of tensions with the police are very common. Uh, a, a few weeks later, uh, a, uh, a high school student, um, Rachel Luando, her name was, um, realized that the, her, she normally encountered Facebook events when her friends were having a party, um, like, you know, uh, inviting people, bring, telling, you know, bring beer, bring your friends, whatever, here it is, who's coming. And they would use that information about who's coming to determine if they wanted to go, because a lot of the things we think about when we want to go to a party is who else is coming and is it going to be cool, right? Like, socially, we think about that all the time. So that Facebook feature, when you have an event that says who else of your friends is coming is really helpful. So it just occurred to her, well, that same thing, that same phenomenon could be used to organize a protest. And so she uh, put up a, a Facebook event and called for a walkout of schools across New Jersey uh, to protest against police brutality and also against cuts to the education uh, department that uh, the governor of New Jersey had just proposed. Um, it was kind of the last straw. It was just sort of this comprehensive attack on youth, basically, uh, across these issues. And so she organized this, this day protest, day long protest. And she just started a Facebook event, put it up. Uh, six, uh, by, by day two, or day one, about 40 of her friends had signed up and saying they were going to participate in the walkout. Uh, by day two, uh, 600 uh, students across New Jersey, most of whom she didn't know, had said they were going to participate. And at that point, uh, the school authorities across the state started threatening and putting in the comments of this event on Facebook that this is a violation of the rules of the law, that students who participated in the walkout would risk uh, being banned from graduation, maybe not graduating at all, possibly criminal offenses. Uh, and you can imagine in a situation like this, this had just happened uh, several days before this incident we just saw, that tensions were high, fear was high about how the police were going to respond. Uh, but those, the, the event, when they started introducing their threats, it was around 600 RSVPs. Within two days, it was at 16,000 RSVPs. So people just responded en masse. And the reason why was because they could see how many of their friends were doing it. And the norm shifted in that moment from the previous norm of everybody just kind of heads down going to school to enough of my friends are walking out that this is going to be the thing to do. And it will be uh, almost more abnormal if I stay and, in, in, and, and succumb to pressure from the administration than if I join my friends and walk out. And one of the things that I think is a, is a powerful principle of, of online organizing is your ability to make consensus visible and to do it uh, quickly. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who's a, an author, have you guys heard of Malcolm Gladwell? He, he writes a lot of kind of sociology observation books. He wrote an article attacking the potential of online organizing, and I, the article I referenced was a response to it that I wrote. One of his main arguments was that uh, real activism requires uh, risky behavior. And if you're not willing to take risks, then uh, you can't really challenge entrenched systems. And that taking risks requires strong ties, uh, meaning people will take risks when they're doing it with close friends, people who they really trust. Uh, how, how many of you can relate to that? concept. If you were going to do something you thought was illegal, that you thought maybe would get a police response, would get you in trouble, you'd be more likely to do it if you had very close friends who you were doing it with. Yeah? I mean, I'd certainly feel that way. And his, his, his argument was that on Twitter and on Facebook, it's just, it's not close friends, it's everyone. People we went to high school with 10 years ago, we don't care about it anymore. So you can't use them to mobilize tight relationships. And my response to that is that you can use these social networks uh, in two ways. Certainly, they do involve your, your weak ties, people you barely know or don't know very well or haven't spoken to in a long time. But those people, that broad community of your friends, have the ability to determine what's normal within a certain group of friends, or within a certain social network, which goes beyond just a very tight group of friends. And when things reach a tipping point, 
That is an extremely important motivator for getting people to do things that would otherwise be too risky for them. And I think that's an important point to bear in mind. The, the weak ties, the broad social networks, have a huge impact on what we think is, is normal and, 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 and what is cool and fun and acceptable and, will, and we're willing to do. But also, it's just a way to communicate very rapidly between small groups of strong ties, meaning each one of us maybe has three or four friends that we're closest to. But if you kind of imagine a, 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 a network structure, there's clumps of those people all over the place. And they may use phones or email or knocking on each other's doors or seeing each other in class to communicate but they communicate between each other through these digital tools. So a lot of what you're doing is not just mobilizing large, vast clouds of people who barely know each other. You're mobilizing clusters of individuals who do know each other and are willing to take risks together. Yes? Do you not think that, I mean, just first of all, the, the, I think the other argument that Gladwell put out was also that you know, these online tools aren't great at fostering commitment. Like that's the other aspect of things mm. that you need. You need to have a deep-seated commitment that you build over a long period of time in order to challenge something. And you know, he cited, for example, um, the citizens um, mm. in, in, in the south and how the, to build up to that process wasn't just like an email or an SMS. It was <laughs> education and talking and organizing yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, creating yeah. that space. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. Um, just in you know, what your response was. And the second thing was um, that I wanted to say was, um, it's, uh, sorry, the, with the example that you gave, yeah. one thing that was already existing in the example that you gave was that people in that area already had commitment to the issue. So as in they, they understood that this was a problem, it was in the news, it affected them and people like them, mm. and they, needed some way of feeling, you know, of doing something. In the same way of people maybe in, you know, um, North Africa felt, you know, wronged by the system. They felt like that they needed a way of expressing themselves. And along came this tool that said, if you do this, this is how you could do it. And they, you know, obviously it's a brilliant way of, you know, getting people to do something when they already feel like they are angry and want to act. Mm. But what's more interesting to me is if the issue isn't commonly accepted, uh, by you know uh, the general public, then you know is it is, is this the way of introducing it? Does it like mm. make people believe something that they don't really believe? Okay, two great questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me take notes of that, and I'll I'll work to them as I continue, if that's okay. Thank you for raising both of those. Um, okay, so to continue. I want to, if I may. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell two stories. So one, and it actually addresses your, your points in, in various ways. So one is, um, I want to tell quickly the story of Cindy Sheehan uh, and protesting the Iraq War. Uh, does that name ring any bells to anyone here, Cindy Sheehan? So she was a woman. She lived in California. She had uh, a son um, named uh, Corey. And uh, he was a soldier in the Iraq War, and he was killed. And like many Americans at the time, she was against the war. But of course, when she lost her own son, it became much more deeply personal. She didn't know what to do about it. Um, she wrote the president and just asked, as a bereaved mother of a soldier, I would just like an explanation as to why we're still there. You said we went into this war because there were weapons of mass destruction and connections to Al Qaeda and 9-11. And there clearly are neither of those. So what are we doing? And why did my son die? And why are you asking more children to die uh, when all of your arguments you know, prove false? Obviously, the president didn't want to respond to her and didn't. So she kept asking and she kept asking. Eventually, what she did is she sent up Casey, not Corey, sorry. She sent up, set up what she called Camp Casey. Uh, what was really innovative about this is that normally you think to lobby the president, you go to the White House in Washington, DC. Uh, she actually went to his ranch in Crawford, Texas, uh, where he claimed to be from. He's actually from a very wealthy town in Connecticut, but uh, he wanted to be cowboy bush, and so he moved to a ranch in Crawford, Texas, and he set up uh, his home there. So she went there during one of Bush's many extended vacations to the ranch, and uh, we call this Camp Casey. Now I tell this story because there was nothing online organizing about that. That was just one woman and her close associates, a set of very strong ties, her and a few people, who uh, were very committed to the cause and knew each other very well, taking a bold risk. One of the places where online organizing comes in is taking a moment like that and then 
magnifying it, making it an, an organizing moment that many, many, many people can participate in. So she set up her camp on August 6, 2005. It was just her and a half dozen really close friends literally in a tent to Camp Casey with their demands written out, asking to meet the president every single day. Move on, we were dedicated to organizing people against the war. And when we heard that this was happening, we realized that this was a, a way that people could get involved. The war had been going on for a few years now. It was starting to be very depressing uh, to think that we could ever make progress in it. But here was a woman's story that we could identify with and that it was a, another way of kind of standing up and showing our opposition. So we sent out an, a request. We said, who would like to organize their own Camp Casey in their neighborhood? And stand with Cindy Sheehan and ask the president to meet with her and answer to her and to every bereaved parent across the country why our children are continuing to die for his lives. And uh, remember, there was one camp on August 6th. By August 17th, there were 1,627 camps, Camp Casey's, organized all over the country, with over 200,000 people uh, participating. It was one of the largest offline events uh, MoveOn had ever organized. I tell this story for a couple of reasons. One, because in each one of those 1,627 camps, there was probably a nucleus of tight relationships. A few friends, one or two, who emailed each other when they got the email from MoveOn and said, hey, what do you think? We went to school together. We had some experiences together. We care about this. Let's go out and do it. Those tight relationships were, in fact, vital for getting people to step out of their homes, set up a tent, uh, potentially risk you know, police uh, response or the scorn of the public around them who still supported the war or supported Bush, et cetera. It was, took risks. It was bravery. Um, but it was the vast network between Move On members that connected all of those clusters of strong tie relationships that allowed that to happen. So I tell it because it's a great illustration of how the strong tie clusters and the vast uh, network of weak tie relationships work. But to put this in, in a bit of a historical context, Gladwell mentions the, uh, the sit-ins that uh, happened across uh, the United States in the late 1960s, uh, the, or the early to mid-1960s, to protest segregation. Do you guys know uh, Jim Crow? Do you know that phrase? Raise your hand if you know the phrase Jim Crow. Wow, oh, okay. Um, so Jim Crow was a series of laws that in some ways resembled apartheid laws in the United States. Apartheid, I think, was more comprehensive and more intense, but very similar principle. They were different places where blacks and whites were allowed to go uh, across the South. Uh, in the United States, uh, up until 1965, uh, these laws were common across the southern United States. So there were drinking fountains for what were called colored people, which meant blacks or <laughs> anyone who wasn't white. Uh, and there were drinking fountains for white people. And there were restaurants where blacks could go and restaurants where whites could go. And there were streets and there were different voting rules and uh, different property ownership rules. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this starts to sound familiar. And uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, do you guys know Martin Luther King? Everybody know that name? So one of the greatest leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. But the Civil Rights Movement was about far more than just one leader and one organization. It was about a series of inspiring stories uh, all across the South and the North uh, where individual leaders stepped up, defied these laws, many got arrested, and over time, through their, their high-profile activism, generated enough attention and enough criticism of these Jim Crow laws that uh, the, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1965, and then court cases and, and many other pieces of legislation that eventually dismantled that system. Um, one of the most famous ones is the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, where a group of four black students who had been heavily trained, as you mentioned, uh, came out of the NAACP. Do you guys know that NAACP? National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, one of the largest civil rights organizations in the United States. They had been trained by them. They went in and they sat down where they weren't allowed to sit. It was called a sit-in. It was illegal. They were colored. They weren't supposed to be there. But they said, it's a free country. We should be able to. They knew they were going to get arrested. That's the story that everybody knows. It's very famous. Uh, Rosa Parks, anybody know that name? She was famous because she sat down on a bus in the front of the bus where black people were not allowed to sit in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, it's another example of that same sort of thing. But the real theory of change behind what they were doing wasn't, let's just get everyone to sit in every, every segregated counter, in every segregated restaurant across the South uh, until they're just all filled up. The theory of change was, let's do something high profile that gets a lot of attention, that showcases how unjust this is. And then let's reach out through whatever tools we can, as fast as we can and as far as we can, to spread the news about what we've done and encourage other people to, to, to come along with us. 
And then let's hope the media covers that and writes stories and it gets in the national press and talked by these stories and are motivated to take action. So I want to read uh, a little passage. This is in a historian's um, account of what happened after that sit-in at the Woolworths counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, let's see. Sorry, give me one second to find it. All right. Okay. So. A very famous historian named Taylor Branch writes in his book, Parting the Waters, The History of the American Civil Rights Movement, um, about that, about that city, the immediate aftermath. He says, the four instantly famous students of the campus of North Carolina A&T, that was the school, uh, were meeting with elected student leaders, and rumors spread that others were volunteering to join them in the morning. With telephones buzzing between, between campuses, word flashed that even some of the white students from Greensboro College wanted to sit in with them. So this was something that they, they, they did, they initiated, and then they started this telephone tree, which was the fastest way that they had to communicate at the time, and got, then it just sort of spread like wildfire. This is an exciting idea. I want to be part of it. This is cool. The more phones that rang, the more people who jumped in on the action. Now compare this to the New Jersey Star-Ledger, the newspaper of New Jersey, description of the morning of that walkout that I described at the beginning, the response to that police brutality clip that you saw. The walkout was scheduled to start at 1 p.m., but when the students at Wikahik High School walked out early, word spread like wildfire that the protest had begun. Phone calls, text, Twitter, Facebook, everything, said Shabazz senior Donald Jackson 17, who was leading a march of students down Broad Street. It's not that different, is it? It's just that we're using new tools in new ways to carry on an old tradition of vanguard risk-taking that highlights an injustice, encourages other people to follow suit, and uses large networks of weak ties to get small clumps of friends and activists with strong ties to take a similar action. And hopefully that provokes broader, broader awareness, and that leads to change. I'll, I want to tell now one longer story about the campaign I led for, uh, or worked on for healthcare reform with Barack Obama. Because the examples I've given so far uh, are, well, the, the Cindy Sheehan thing is a, is, a, is a coordinated initiative led by move on and, and driven by staff. But this example, the walkout, is this kind of spontaneous thing. And these tools, these techniques of online organizing can work both in spontaneous bottom-up ways and also in very coordinated, strategically led ways. So I'll just walk you through quickly this, this story here. And I'll turn it over to Paul and we'll address some more questions. So, um, so Barack Obama, how many know that name? <laughs> Great. Um, very popular fellow. Um, so he was elected in 2008, very popular president. Um, but as I, I don't know if you guys know about the separation of the powers in, in the United States government. It's, it's different than a parliamentary system. So the president can have a proposal, but it doesn't really matter unless Congress passes that proposal. And so the president doesn't control the, the legislature. He can't just pass laws if, if he wants to. He has to propose them. Congress has to vote on them. So when Obama got elected, he had this big top goal, which is to reform America's healthcare system. And the problem with America's healthcare system was that you can't, you weren't guaranteed healthcare uh, at all. And most people got healthcare insurance, which would cover their costs if they got sick, through their jobs. But if the jobs stop providing healthcare, you're screwed. If you get fired, you're screwed. If you want to quit because you want to try to get a better job, or go back to school, or you have to take care of a sick loved one, or your house burns down, or anything, you're screwed. And if you try to get insurance privately through <coughs> an insurance company, uh, if you have any illness at all to begin with, they call it a pre-existing condition, which means they either won't give you insurance, or they won't cover whatever it is you already have. Like HIV. Like HIV. Very much so. Uh, which for anyone with HIV or any chronic condition is the kiss of death, literally. And it means that you just can't get care for the thing that you need. It's a terrible system. And it first came home to me and moved me into politics or political life in general when I was seven. Uh, my mother is uh, very sick, chronically ill, has been my whole life. Uh, but when I was seven years old, she was on a group health care plan uh, that was from an old job as a teacher. And that plan got dissolved. They just said, you know, like the insurance company said, we don't like this plan anymore. So she was free to reapply and get her own plan, except she wasn't going to be covered for anything she already had. 
which meant everything she needed care for. And she was too sick at that point to get another job, which would cover her uh, under an employer plan. So she became one of the millions of Americans, 33 million Americans as of 2008, uh, who fell through the cracks who didn't have any health care at all. And that for me was a huge wake-up call, that there was something very rotten at the core of this system. And if it affected my mother, it affected other mothers, and that we needed a systemic solution to deal with that. And I was only seven, so I didn't, there wasn't anything I could really do other than try to be a lawyer, because I saw them on TV and I thought they argued and that was cool. Uh, but eventually I thought about politics and I thought about organizing, and I got into this digital stuff, because it seemed to be what people were using today. And I ended up with this job uh, being the director of campaigns and fundraising for what was called Organizing for America, which is about 20 million supporters of Barack Obama who had joined up through the election, who were now, our job was to mobilize them to push the president's agenda through Congress. And this one was going to be a big fight, because we had some of the largest corporate opponents you can have, uh, particularly the health insurance industry, which is massive. And they spent uh, $500 million uh, opposing us. $500 million. Uh, lobbying, running ads, uh, funding uh, opposition infrastructure to defeat this proposal. So even though we had the president, and even though we had a majority in Congress, uh, it was a huge uphill battle. So I want to just give you a sense of uh, what we did. This, by the way, is what I believe about elections. This is uh, Barack Obama's quote on election night. Winning is not the point. Winning an election. It just gives you the chance to do the things that actually matter. So this is our story of how we did that. Um, just some top line notes. Uh, we, mo we mobilized around 4 million people who actually took action in the campaign. Gives you a sense we had 20 million people who were signed up and only, only 4 million took action. It was, it's a lot by some measures, but it just gives you a sense of why big numbers can be really important with this stuff, because you only get a percentage to take action on a given thing. Um, from 26,389 cities to take uh, 20,019,290 recorded actions. One of the other advantages of digital organizing is that you can count things <laughs> relatively easily. Very trackable, a lot of data. Uh, and I hope you've, you've already started to gleam from my story so far, digital organizing is not about things that happen online. Communication happens online, but the things that matter are just as likely to happen offline, and we'll see more of that here. So many of those 20 million are offline. We generated uh, over 4 million direct contacts from people to their members of Congress, 33,000 pro-reform public events in 4,000 cities, an average of 732 events per week. Those events range from giant rallies to just somebody handing out flyers at a farmer's market, anything that was kind of offline facing the public. But that's still a lot of them and over 3 million voter-to-voter -voter phone calls and door-to-door -door house calls. But let me break that down for you. I want to talk a little bit strategically about what we did. So there's these three kinds of tactics we employed. Organizing, which was supporters talking to supporters, building information uh, amongst each other, sharing information, learning, building structures amongst each other, spreading the facts, speaking out, communicating the facts to the public who were being heavily misled by Fox News. Do you guys know Fox News? Is that ring a bell? It's a right-wing news television station in the United States. Do you guys have an equivalent here, any media that tends to say things that aren't true? No? Well, I'm, I'm national broadcast media. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're lucky you don't have a Fox News. If someone named Rupert Murdoch ever knocks on your door and asks if you can start a TV network in South Africa, show him the door. Um, and, uh, and bringing the people's voice to Congress. So that's speaking up. So I like to talk about these three basic strategies that often show up in our campaigns. Organizing, building, building connections between supporters, speaking out, pushing the message out to the public, and speaking up, direct advocacy to decision makers from constituents. So just to quickly run through some of the highlights of the campaign. So this is our organizing structure. It was based on this local leadership concept. The circle in the middle is what's called a community organizer. That is a volunteer who committed uh, 20 hours a month, or uh, at minimum, uh, to, uh, to, to, to organize for health reform in their community. Each community organizer was responsible for a group, usually around five or six, what are called neighborhood team leaders. That's what NTL stands for here. An NTL also volunteer uh, committed last, I think it was um, five, uh, ten, five to 10 hours a month. Uh, and then each neighborhood team leader had a varying number of what are called neighborhood team members. And those often maybe they would show up for one event every couple months. Some of them were very regular. And what these guys would do is make sure that these guys, the neighborhood team leaders, were on, uh, on track. They would call them, they'd say, did you, did you have 
uh, your, your, later, your, your latest round of events, with, whether it's voter contact, organizing canvassing events, organizing phone banking parties, uh, organizing rallies, writing letters to the editor, whatever it is. Did, did you do that? How did it go? What are your numbers? They would record the numbers, send them back up to us. That's part of how we were to keep, able to keep track. But they didn't do any direct voter contact or, or organize the events themselves. They organized the organizers. These guys were the ones that organized the events and got all these people to participate. And then towards the end, we were able to get some of these neighborhood team members to kind of step up and become branch off and become their own neighborhood team leaders and they sort of go boop over here and they would have their own circle of neighborhood team members around them. We, this structure in large part came from the campaign, but the campaign had thousands of staff, well, literally like 1,500 staff in just doing field across the country. And we had like 60. Uh, there was just a much smaller budget than during the campaign because many fewer people would donate uh, because everyone likes donating during elections. But, forgets about what happens next. So we had a smaller budget. So this all had to be volunteer, uh, this all had to be volunteer run. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay, so local gatherings, this is in the organizing side of things. This is all organizing now. Um, so we had thousands of, of, uh, of these events where people would come and as you can just see pictured here, they would gather around living rooms. They would uh, formulate plans for how they were going to do visibility events in their neighborhood, or they would distribute clipboards and go door to door. Um, they would get videos and information sheets about healthcare and just uh, learn about what the reform actually promised. Um, sometimes they'd connect to national events. So, like this is uh, the State of the Union. We have watching parties. It's another important like, organizing tactic is connecting to outside. The little the cells of people all over the place to whatever if there's kind of a central stream of content. Um, we brought a bunch of new people in, which is exciting for us because obviously the election was the thing that really sucked people in. But we got uh, over 1.2 million people who weren't part of the election to be part of this healthcare campaign, which was really exciting for us. Um, one of the things we worked on was facilitating virtual contact. I think it was you were talking about conversations that wouldn't otherwise be able to happen. One of that was between the president and, and the supporters. So we had more than 275,000 supporters uh, participating in the National Health Care Forum uh, at, at OFA headquarters, which is where Obama was kind of explaining the plan, laying out the strategy. We could only get a few hundred in the room, but 275,000 participated virtually by watching and asking questions. We had thousands of questions. And funding. We raised about $90 million, uh, a fraction of the $500 million they raised for the campaign but enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with ads, with organizing staff, with support for the volunteers, clipboards, vans, all those things you need to get people out door-to-door. -door. Um, but honestly, most of it went to advertising because they spent $500 million advertising against us. And uh, both to directly persuade voters we had to fight back, but also to show very nervous politicians that there was a counter message out there. Something politicians are very sensitive about when they think their voters are getting hammered with negative messaging. It's really important to them to know there's a counterbalance. That's kind of organizing. Speaking out, spreading the facts. So it happened in a lot of different ways. On the doorstep, going door to door, we had 3,000 uh, canvassing events in which local staging grounds were, were, were organized. People would, volunteers would go, the neighborhood team members would go, and the neighborhood team leader had a little place where you could get the clipboard and the list and go around door to door. On the phone lines, this was particularly important because we had a special election where one candidate was for health reform, the other was against. We tried to reach out to voters in that election make sure they voted the right way. Um, there's a lot of misinformation to fight back against. This is a, this is a screenshot of Sarah Palin. How many know Sarah Palin? I'm curious, show of hands, who knows the name Sarah Palin? Oh, too many. Let's, let's all forget her. Um, she was a uh, vice presidential candidate in 2008. She was a real whack, wacko. And here, she was talking about death panels. And, and this really took off as, as a rumor. Um, and. This is just one of the most insidious things that can happen when there's a lie about what you're trying to do that makes people afraid. Fear is a very difficult thing to overcome when you're fighting for big change. And healthcare gets to the core of what people are afraid of because it's our lives. And her lie was that uh, this, this government program would create death panels, she called them, which would ration out healthcare and kill your grandparents, basically. Decide when your grandparents could or could not get care. And they would just pull it back at the end. Obviously, the insurance companies do that today in large numbers. Um, and this would make that impossible, but it's the opposite of the truth, but she put it out there, and uh, we had to fight very hard against it. How did we do that? 
So on the radio, we had people call radio stations. You guys have radio stations here where there's like news talk and people call in and express their opinions? Yes. So, so we created a tool where you can go online, it's just digital tools, go online, and you can find, just enter your zip code, postcode, you find uh, the radio stations that are near you that are talking about relevant things, the phone numbers to call them. You can do that and then speak out with real information about the healthcare reform package, which we also provided. So we had thousands and thousands of those across the country. Writing letters to the editor. Do you guys have newspapers here where people write letters to the editor and they get printed? Does that, does that happen here? You guys familiar with that? Who's here has ever written a letter to the editor? Just about a third of the room. So this was another important tactic. Using digital tools, we, we, we sent out emails. We asked people to write letters to the editor. You could write it online. It would be submitted automatically. But that speak that pushes the message out. People read those letters. It's also important to remember about that is that even if they don't publish your letter, the, the editorial boards of these newspapers, they're almost like politicians in of themselves. They're trying to sell newspapers. They want to know what people think. They want to know what people are passionate about. They're more likely to cover an issue if they think people are interested in it, and they're sensitive to the bias of their readership. And they want to kind of match it so they continue to sell newspapers. So if they get a lot of letters from people reading their newspaper saying, this is what I think about health reform and it's important, even if those letters don't get published, you're kind of lobbying the, the editorial staff of that newspaper. You're giving them a sense of what their readers want. So you can start to move their behavior over time, how much attention they give it in their news section. So it's a really important tactic, even if it doesn't get published. These are some examples of the ones that did. We put our members on television ads, which we raised money for from members to put on TV. These were doctors and nurses that were OFA supporters. We put them, interviewed them, put them on TV. And we ran a, a lot of web ads to promote information, interactive stuff. We did a lot of offline events. We did a bus tour all over the country. Here was the route. All over the country. How many kilometers? Oh, man. Well, this this to this is 3,000 miles, which is 5,000 kilometers, something in that neighborhood. Um, and they did it you know, roughly twice, so I, up and down, so I'd say 10,000 kilometers. It's a lot of kilometers. Not a great carbon footprint, but sadly wasn't our priority. Um, and so, uh, here's something else I want to point out. This, see this sign here that says thank you? Now, I don't know how relevant or not this will be, but one of the, one of the interesting dynamics, we had a lot of Democrats in particular who were elected from marginal districts. I know mean, this isn't really the same thing here, so I'll say it just to touch on this very briefly, but they were scared that if they supported health care reform, remember I said the opposition spent $500 million opposing us? One of the things they spent it on was a large infrastructure to push people into, uh, into, into government meetings and, and town halls to talk about how health care was going to kill grandma and it was terrible. So these guys who were in marginal districts were really scared. So one of the things we did was positive messaging in those districts for people who were saying good things. Obviously we had to wait and see if they were saying good things or not, but if they were, we would do that. And that was very, that was very helpful. Have you guys heard of the Tea Party? So this is when the Tea Party started. It was, this is who we were fighting against was the Tea Party. Some of that was very authentic because just people, they think grandma's going to die or going to be authentically upset. And some of that was really artificial. People paid, bust into, into rallies, that kind of thing. But we had to fight against that. Um, all right, then speaking up, what did, how did we, we also did a, by the way, this isn't recorded. <laughs> funny start. We, we did a, a, a member-generated video contest called Health Reform in 30 Seconds. I told some of you guys the story the other day about Bush in 30 Seconds. This was health reform in 30 seconds. Got some great videos. The reason this isn't in here is because this report was officially authorized by the by the, the Democratic Party, which ran this whole thing. And the person who submitted the ad that won, only at, well afterwards did we figure out, was wanted on some sort of pornography trafficking <laughs> thing. And so they got really scared, and we can't talk about that anymore. But he made an amazing video. <laughs> it was about going into McDonald's and ordering fries. It was about this pre-existing conditions thing. It was a guy going into McDonald's. Say, I'd like an order of fries, please. And the guy behind the counter is like, great. Uh, are you hungry? And the guy was like, well, yeah, that's why I'm ordering fries. Like, ooh, sorry, can't, can't sell you the fries if you're already hungry. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't make any sense. It's as ridiculous as not giving health care for someone for what they actually needed for at the time. It was a great, it was a great ad. Um, so our names, we had 2 million people sign a petition, online, offline, combined, that uh, went up to each member of Congress, divided by district, so they could see which in their constituents had signed it. Um, we had, this is a, a holiday card. You can't really see it well here, but it's kind of like frosty. It was around Christmas time. 
when people sent holiday cards and said, what I want this holiday season, my wish is for health reform. Um, our stories, this was very powerful. So Obama, at the very end, started using individual stories of, of a woman who was sick, who she said her name was, but um, it was Larissa or something like that. But he, he became in his stump speech, he was like, I'm doing this for Larissa. So we, we, we asked people to send, to take a little photo of themselves with who they're, who they're fighting for health reform for, to, to remind people how important this is. These guys saying, I'm here for Robin. This guy saying, I'm here for my five grandsons. This is a, an elderly African American woman. Uh, and then we made this, put this newspaper ad in the newspaper that goes directly to members of Congress called a Roll Call in Washington, DC. And it said, there are many reasons to fight for health reform, but for each of us, one reason matters most. And it's just pictures of these people from around the country holding the signs of who they're fighting for. Uh, we set up uh, health reform phone booths around the country that looked like old-fashioned phone booths. But you would go in and you'd be given the number of your members of Congress, your senators, your representatives to call. They were set up all over the country. So just tons and tons of phone calls. Um, on one day, a time to deliver day of action, October 20th, 2009, through a combination of online and offline, we emailed people, we gave people information, we had these going on all over the country. Uh, we generated 312,000 calls to Congress uh, from all 435 congressional districts. Big day. Um, this was another really important one. You fight, we'll fight. So here's what we did. Basically, remember I said there were these a bunch of members of Congress who were in marginal districts that were nervous about supporting health reform. We had our supporters fill out a form and said, if your member of Congress supports health reform, will you volunteer to reelect them? And similarly, if they don't, will you hold back or volunteer for, your, for the opponent? Uh, and we collected, you could, you could do the math and, and add up how many hours you said, in, in the election wasn't for another two years. But, but if you did the math, the number of hours per week people said they would work in the three months leading up to the next election added up to 10 million 562,221 volunteer hours, over 10 million hours that people pledged. So we put that also in an ad in roll call, but we also sent each member of Congress a sheet with how many volunteer hours were pledged in their district. Because if they're worried they're going to get attacked, there's nothing more powerful they can see but that in your district you've got 32,000 volunteer hours that will either come out in force for you, or if you vote for health reform, or if you don't, stay home or even work for your opponent if you don't. Really shifts the electoral equation. So it's a way to like use elections, in this case, almost two years uh, or, or a year before they happen. So there was a final final march. There you had to go back and forth and back and forth in the House and the Senate. It kept getting edited, different versions. Uh, finally, it came down to the final vote. It was vi really a nail biter. We had no idea how it was going to go. I mean, it had been 11 months. Everything you just saw here, bus tours, rallies, billions of phone calls, you know, ads, everything you could think of. And it was still just such a nail biter at the end. A couple of little anecdotes from the very final vote. Um, on the final day of the vote, Representative Mike Doyle told this story on the floor of the House. My office got a call today from Mary Ann Ferguson, 91 years old, from Pittsburgh. She asked me to vote for health reform because she wants everyone to get the coverage she has. She remembers before Medicare when half of our seniors worried about getting sick because they had no health insurance. That's a program for elderly in the United States. Um, this is a picture of Marianne Ferguson. Turns out she was a, an OFA volunteer, and she had just made that call in response to an email that we had sent her. And this was the story the representative told himself on the floor of Congress, explaining why finally he had decided to vote for health reform. Um, representative Brian Baird of Washington State, one of these moderate ones, voted against it the first time it came before the House. Uh, but he'd been on the fence for weeks about how to vote in the final round. Just hours before the votes were cast, he announced his support. He switched sides, which we needed him to do if we were going to pass it. His office cited 1,720 in-district pro-reform constituent calls he received the previous Friday as a major factor. That in-district thing is a big deal, because remember the $500 million spent against us, a lot of that was paying people to call congressional offices around the country, even though they didn't live in the district. And so they were carefully tracking when people called, they got their address, do you live in my district? Of the 1,700 calls that this guy cited is why he switched his position, 72% of that number were, were logged through our system, meaning we reached out to them with email, put the phone number in front of them, they had clicked the link that we provided saying that they made the call, and that's 
how we knew it. That was 72% were reported from our system. So a little more than that probably happened without the reporting. But it just gives you a sense of how much this, this pushing out really gets people to take action they wouldn't have otherwise taken. 72% came from that. And, and he cited that as why he voted. So finally, it passed uh, in, in early March uh, in a nail-biting vote with a margin of, I think, three out of 435 representatives. And on March 23, 2010, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law. 32 million Americans had health care for the first time. And I'll, I'll read you just the last bit of this email. I, I wrote the President's emails during this period. That was part of my job, was to kind of be the President's voice online. But this was, out of all the many emails I've written in my life, this was, this was my favorite. And you also have to remember, this was the day that uh, my mom was able, for the first time in my life, to have a guaranteed right to health care. Um, our journey began three years ago, driven by a shared belief that fundamental change is indeed still possible. We have worked hard together every day since to deliver on that belief. We have shared moments of tremendous hope, and we have faced setbacks and doubt. We have all been forced to ask if our politics had simply become too polarized and too short-sighted to meet the pressing challenges of our time. This struggle for reform became a test of whether the American people could still rally together when the cause was right and actually create the change we believe in. Tonight, thanks to your mighty efforts, the answer is indisputable. Yes, we can. So can online organizing change the world? Well, it's only one part of a broad recipe. But yes, I think the answer is yes, it can. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so Paul was going to share a, a, a few uh, quick stories from Australia, so yeah. we can get a bit more of just not beyond America. Um, I was thinking just thought maybe we can, you know, if everyone can stand up, that's, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so we're all activists, right? Raise your hand if you're an activist. Yeah, I thought as much. Okay, so as activists, one of the first things we need to do is reach for the grassroots. So let's everyone reach for the grassroots. Let's go. <laughs> We reach for the grassroots. Okay. Okay. We found the grassroots. Let's reach, let's reach for the money tree because we need money to run our campaigns, right? So let's reach for the money tree. Okay. And now, because we're mostly progressive, let's move to your left. Move to your left. Move to your other left. So I want to tell you two brief stories. The first. My friend Baba. So I met Baba, he's a Maasai warrior on the plains of Kenya. And every day he takes people from around the world to see lions, zebra, you know, showing the amazing wildlife of Africa. And there was one day I was with Baba and we kind of crossed over this ridge and right before me there were just dead wildebeest, zebra, and cattle. You see, Baba explained to me that his community had been really badly affected by drought. The worst drought in living memory. In fact, some of the farmers in this area were being affected um, by drought in such a bad way that many farmers were committing suicide. What was interesting for me is I was thinking this is such a bad issue. And then I had this realization that when, I'm, when I go to bed at night and I switch that light off in my room, if I leave that light on and that electricity is going, that electricity is coming from a coal-fired power station that's emitting pollution into the atmosphere. And that pollution all the way around the world is warming the planet, which means for people like Baba in Kenya, it's increasing the temperature, which is having, you know, climate change is having such a serious effect. And the reality is, is with climate change, as we learned a lot about when South Africa hosted the climate change negotiations in Durban, as that climate change affects the poor first and hardest, yet they have the least to do with the problem in the first place. Which brings me to the second person I want to tell you about, is my friend Daniel. Now Daniel is an Australian guy, and Australia is one of the highest emitters of pollution into the atmosphere, which is accelerating climate change. And Daniel has never been to Kenya, doesn't care what's going on. He, you know, he leaves his giant plasma TV on all day, you know, he doesn't really need to worry about this issue of climate change. So the challenge for me is, how do I get people like Daniel and millions of people like him in Australia engaged in this issue? Now raise your hand if you've got a friend that you've tried so many times to get excited about taking action, but they just weren't listening. 
Okay, so it sounds like a shared, a shared problem. And you, you want to pull your hair out because they're not really wanting to engage. And I think this is so incredibly difficult. It's, it's incredibly, like, it's so, when you share stories of what happens in South Africa when we are frustrated about something, and you try to get Australians frustrated about something, it's extremely difficult. So what we looked at doing was uh, we created a video about climate change to try to get people interested in. We had some celebrities and what I did is I posted that video on Daniel's Facebook page and said, hey man, check this out. And he was kind of interested in it and then I started tweeting at him and saying, hey, have you seen this article on this issue of climate change that Australia needs to take more responsibility for the impact it's having in the global community? And over time, through ongoing pestering through different communication channels, Basically, Daniel finally, at my pestering, signed up to our email list on this website for this campaign we were running. And what would happen, we started sending him emails and we asked him to sign a petition. And then we asked him to donate $5 to help put an advertisement on TV. Because at the moment, what was happening in Australia is we were wanting the government to introduce a price on carbon, a carbon tax, so that the top polluters in Australia would have to pay because they were polluting our shared air and that we wanted them to be, you know, have to compensate and invest that money through compensation into investments in renewable energy, so solar, wind, and other renewable energies. And we were up against a tough crowd, because as you know, companies, particularly mining companies, are very big and powerful. So they have these huge amounts of money to put on advertisements on TV and magazines, newspapers. So they've got this big, you know, mouthpiece. But how do we as people, how do we reclaim that and show people power prevails at the end of the day? And so what we did is we asked people for small donations. So we sent out you know, a list to hundreds of thousands of people who signed up because they'd seen our video. And we asked them for just chip in $5. Say 10,000 people chipping in $5, $100,000, we can now buy time, prime time television time, put our advert on TV. People see that advert, they go to our website, we sign up, so we get even more people. And then what was extraordinary is over time, we finally got people like Daniel, we sent them an important email saying, hey, we've got an event, we've got a national day of action, but you sign up, will you get involved, will you come to a march? And what was extraordinary is when I went to this march we organized, I saw my friend Daniel there, and he'd actually brought his friends along. See, Daniel had been on what we call a supported journey in the online kind of campaigning space. Slowly over time, we take him up, him up the ladder of engagement, from being someone who doesn't care about climate change to suddenly being this amazing hardcore activist. And I think this is possibly the role the stuff can play. So I'm not sure if you want to show this video, just to give you a bit February of a snapshot. 2011. For a decade, our movement had been building. Yet after years of climate change debate, there still hadn't been any real action taken. Nine months later, two words had helped change all that. Say Yes started when nine can... That's oh, okay. Basically, we after so sixty percent of us, so a year out from this finale, sixty percent of Australians, the organisations representing over three million Australians, came together to show support for action on climate change. The pollution lobby came out early with a message of fear and negativity. We wanted our voices heard in a positive way, so we used two simple words to represent our side of the story. Alongside millions of everyday Australians, we have the support of economists, doctors, scientists, religious and former political leaders. But we needed to reach more Australians, so we made a TV app. Urging Australians to say yes to a carbon tax. What if we say yes to making big companies pay when they pollute our skies? And finally, doing something about climate change. The result... Awesome. So yeah, basically, from having 60% of Australians say, no, we don't want a carbon tax, no, we don't want these companies to pay money for dirtying our environment, a year later, we actually managed to swing public opinion in favour and actually managed to get the government to introduce a carbon tax. And a very huge proportion of that money is now actually being invested in renewable energy. So much so that now it is actually cheaper to invest. You get a higher return on investment if you invest in solar power in <laughs> Australia than coal-fired power stations. So there's massive opportunity there. Um, 
I might just pause it there and just swap to the second story I want to tell you guys about. So this is an example of a very centralized digital online campaign. I want to share with you a story of a, a decentralized, um, something that just popped up. So basically Coca-Cola in Australia doesn't have a recycling scheme. So when people you know, throw out their Coca-Cola cans, the Coca-Cola doesn't take any responsibility in trying to clean up the environment. Um, and nor do they, when people bring in cans of Coke to get recycled, do they give people some money back. So this is a, the recycling scheme, a lot of environmental campaigners were trying to get that through. But Coca-Cola was lobbying the government. So obviously, as a big company, they have a lot of political power. So again, the question is, how do we, we as people use the tools we have available to us to respond to this issue? And so someone just had this idea one day, you know, what, how can I make these companies listen to us? And what do companies ultimately respond to at the end of the day? What drives them? Money. So how do you actually stop Coca-Cola actually earning some money so they actually listen to people? Well, it's actually very, very easy. How many times, how often do people go to a Coca-Cola vending machine to grab a Coke? Many vending machines? They're, they're, they're not as, you know, in Australia there's a lot of vending machines. So basically what someone did is they printed an out of order sign, went up to that vending machine and just stuck it on the vending machine. <laughs> and so suddenly, all of a sudden, this guy just created a Facebook page called Out of Order, basically saying you as a company are out of order for the pollution you are bringing into our community and you need to take responsibility by supporting a recycling scheme and stop lobbying our government and interfering with our democracy because you're not a person, you're a company. So basically this guy set up this Facebook page, posted out of order, and posted one photo, and then he shared it with his friends, and his friends shared it with their friends, and it just kept going and going until it became this enormous, or pretty big in Australia for 4,000 people, and everyone was just posting, you know, going to their local vending machine and just posting up an out of order sign, taking a photo on their camera, uploading it, and they just spread like wildfire across the whole country. And Coca-Cola obviously is now getting less money because people are voting, kind of voting, you know, sending a message to Coca-Cola as to how they feel about this issue. And actually you've done the same tactic with a, a bank in Australia. It's uh, the bank's called ANZ, and they're investing in coal-fired power stations, which is driving climate change. And so they use the exact same tactic. People printed out of order signs, went to the ATM, stuck it on the ATM. People stopped using the ATM. And the company's like, okay, these people are really angry that we're messing up the environment. We need to respond. And this is like just one person's idea. One night, just post on Facebook, and like that went viral across the whole country. So I hope those are two interesting stories of how digital campaigning in this sense is being useful. Um, cool. I don't cool. Questions or? Yeah, well, let's thank you, Paul. Let's pause there, take a breath, and then uh, I know there's one of your questions I haven't addressed yet, which I will, but let's see if there's other questions for either Paul or myself or any dis discussion amongst each other. Yeah, uh, both of you guys use the terms positive and negative messaging. Mm. Uh, so first of all, which is more powerful? I mean, for every negative message, you need three positive messages to fight us. And do you guys only use positive messaging? Do you ever use ne negative messaging in your campaigns? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, so, uh, first of all, yes, negative messaging I'm all the time. Uh, and, and in fact, it's much more common. Positive messaging is actually, I think, harder to mobilize people around because generally when people are happy with anything that is happening, the instinct is, I don't need to do anything about it because it's already happening and I'm, I'm happy. So it's easier to mobilize around a negative impulse. It doesn't sound possible to organize around a positive impulse. And sometimes when you know the thing you're happy about is under threat, uh, then it motivates you. But uh, it's, it's, it can be tricky. In terms of which is more powerful, I think it, uh, I think it really all comes down to a, a calculation. I don't think, I mean, I think, look, there's psychology involved. The people who are, who are targeting are human beings. Some are very sensitive. But they're also immune to certain kinds of criticism from certain kinds of people. Because they're, they, they all kind of go into whatever it is they do with a calculation, generally speaking. There's a certain set of people who don't like them already and will never like them. So I, I think a lot of the key for thinking about your messaging is just to think about how do you create an off-the-script response to what political leaders are doing. What I mean by off-the-script is 
Whenever a political leader does anything, there's usually some script in their head for how it's going to play out. If you launch a war, your script is there's going to be a lot of opposition, because that always happens. Um, and so if there's big protests, like in London in 2003, around the Iraq War, or New York, or whatever, they knew, like the politicians of all knew that was going to happen, and they were able to compartmentalize it in their heads, and they're just a bunch of liberals. Um, if you try to do something that's a secret, uh, you, you're, the script, or, or that you don't think is going to be so high profile, the script may be, I'm going to just get away with this, because I'm going to slide it through, and there's not going to be that much opposition. If, if that's the script that people are playing from, you can go off the script relatively easily by just showing there's more opposition than, than might have been expected. The, the group I worked with in the UK called 38 Degrees, when the coalition Tory-led government tried to privatize the national forest, literally sell them off to pay down the deficit um, to private interests who would log them or mine them or close them off or charge emissions or do whatever to make money off of them. Uh, there was a big outcry of opposition. Now this was one where the script was, this is just going to be a quiet thing, people aren't really going to notice. They even bought off the primary group that would fight them by selling them some of the forests, so they were happy, so they thought, okay, no opposition here. 38 degrees, because it's multi-issue, could move around very quickly, moved into this space, created a petition, got 500,000 people. In this case, there was some offline stuff too. They did wonderful not for sale events outside of forests and put up not for sale signs and great iconography. But honestly, it was just the fact this petition that continued to get media coverage meant the script had been blown up. It was getting growing, mounting, spiraling opposition. Ultimately, the government was forced to U-turn. It was the first big U-turn of the new coalition government. And uh, the forest minister actually went to the well of parliament in, in Westminster and apologized to the British people for having such a terrible idea. <laughs> it really almost never happens. <laughs> um, in that case, uh, the, the negative messaging was powerful because they weren't expecting it. If, if, if another, in another case, if like George Bush, for example, <coughs> it thinks that liberals are going to oppose them on anything that he does. So like in the Cindy Sheehan case, the negative messaging was it was impactful there because it was associated with a with an unusual storyline around it, around meeting with this woman and her as a bereaved mother, and it was standing with her and military families, and that brought out advocates for military families and veterans organizations. Negative messaging from them meant a lot because that started to cut into his base and it moved moved off script in his head. Which is the, the hippies will always hate me, but the military folk will always love me, and that's my path towards victory. So if you start to get negative messaging from the people you didn't expect it from, then it starts to be very powerful. So I would say positive or negative actually is not one is more powerful than the other. One is easier to organize around than the other, but its impact on the target will just depend on who it's coming from and what their analysis is about how that affects their, their fortunes. Does that make sense? Do you have any thoughts on that, Paul? Um, we do. So at the end of when we were running this campaign to get the carbon tax put in place, uh, once it was put in place, we ran a campaign with our core supporters saying, send a message to the Prime Minister to say thank you. And what that did is it reinforced that politically, there was lots of positives for doing this. There were still people who were very angry. They didn't want to pay a new tax. But that made it now harder for the government, if it at a later point it wanted to walk away. Now that it had so much positive reinforcement, it just made it much more difficult. So I think you can start with the negative and sometimes finish with the positive. Yeah. The other thing I'll add to that is just I think the most important thing in all of this is to show the authenticity of the conversation. Just to say, it's really important for politicians, if they're going to take the pressure seriously, to understand that it really is linked to their behavior, and it's not just kind of like lockstep, methodical, because they're in a certain party, you're always going to support them, or you're always going to hate them. Because then what you say is kind of functionally irrelevant, unless there's too many of you, and then it's just a pure numbers game. But if you are negative when they do a bad thing, and positive when they do a good thing, it really shows an authenticity in the relationship, which helps you get taken more seriously over time. I once, I once had a really interesting conversation with, a, I, I was, it was the end of a budget campaign in 2005. We had been campaigning really hard against this budget that would slash billions of dollars from education and nutrition and health programs, and also give billions of dollars to the, the rich in tax cuts. We called it a reverse Robin Hood budget. And I was delivering petitions in the halls of Congress, and it was a 4 a.m. vote at, at that point. The, the uh, Republican leadership liked liked calling votes for one, two, three, four, and literally in hopes that the Democrats would get tired and go home. And that's and, and, and that's how they would they would win. I mean it was, you know, strong arm, old school, bare knuckle politics. So it was probably one or two AM and I was going and knocking on doors and I was delivering kind of this last round. We had been delivering it in, in, in rounds, but this is the last round of comments, letters, personal stories, most of them were from people in the districts about how the health programs that were going to be cut had affected their families. And so there's a guy Robin Leach. No no no. Jim Leach uh, from Iowa, Republican. 
And mostly when I knocked on the door, either no one was there or it was just some staffer. But in this case, Congressman himself opens the door and he's got his shirt coming out of his fly and you know, it was like very late, he wasn't expecting anybody. But he brings me in and I, he, he, I tell him who I am and, and you're like, move on. I was like, but these, these are letters from your constituents or in, in your district about the, the, these programs you're about to go vote on. I think you might want to look at them before you cast your vote. He's like, oh, all right, come on in. So we sit down and I give him the thing. He's like, oh, look at these. Well, let me ask you something straight. You guys are going to attack me no matter what I do, aren't you? So why should I listen to you? What does it matter? You're just going to attack me no matter what. And, and I said, well, Congressman, I see your point. Let me tell you two things. One is, our members lead us, not the other way around. And what I can promise you is that we are going to report honestly what you do tonight to our members in your district. What you're holding in your hands is letters from something like 1,200 of your constituents telling you why it's so important to their lives and their families that you vote against these budget cuts. If you do, we will go back to them and tell them that you did. And you see how much this matters to them. If they don't want us to attack you in the next election as a consequence of that, we won't. The other thing you should know, however, is that as long as you continue to vote for Republican leadership, that then means a certain set of major things happen for the country, our members in your district might still want to attack you. But that is also linked to what you do or don't do. But regardless, I can tell you we're going to have an honest conversation with them about what you do tonight. He's like, well, 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 I'll think about it. And I, and I left the office. Two hours later, he did, in fact, vote against it, uh, which ended up being pretty decisive. It's a story about positive and negative pressure and keeping the conversation honest. Um, could you share your experiences and ideas on online fundraising? Because, I mean, getting people to sign a petition online is one thing, but getting them to, to donate is another. So could you just share your experiences? Totally. So my basic philosophy about donations is that, strategically speaking, they're not very different than anything else. What I mean by that is, I think that we serve our members through digital campaigning by allowing them to give everything that they can to the change that they believe in. So it can be their voice, their opinions, their relationships, their ability to make a video or write a song, but it can also be they have a few extra rand in their pocket, uh, a few extra dollars in their pocket. And when you get that, then you start approaching fundraising from the perspective of how do we tell people stories about how their money will be turned into power that they believe in to advance something they care about. And then you just start thinking tactically. What are the tactics that make a difference? Online organizing was invented when MoveOn in 2000, uh, which just had this kind of list of accidental people that had just kind of signed up this petition. It was all not planned. It just kind of happened. A couple threw a petition online about impeachment. A bunch of people signed it. They had this community. They wanted to keep going. And they wanted to put an ad in the New York Times. And the people who ran it, like, we don't have the money to do that, but we've got 500,000 people we can email, I bet collectively, you know, but nobody's done this before. Are people going to feel comfortable using their credit cards? I don't know. They went out and they asked. They needed $30,000 to put the ad in the New York Times. They said, here's the deal, here's the ad, here's why we want to do it, here's what it's relevant to, here's how much it'll cost. There is $120,000. Five times what they need. So that set the set the stage, and it's that spirit of just thinking tactically, being honest with people, showing them the ways that their money can be useful, um, and then reporting back, having a really on, you know, good dialogue, show people the benefits of where the money went. People won't donate, maybe won't donate the first time or the second time. The third time, they've seen a story in their inbox or in their phones, uh, in their Mixit feed, whatever that is, I don't know Mixit well enough to use the right term. Um, they will see that money went to an ad and it, it was like a big billboard on a truck that drove around parliament during a key vote that had the picture of the guy who you know was killed by the police and put it in their face when the minister was walking in to make a key decision. They'll feel good about that. They'll feel like that's something I wish I made happen. And then the next time you give them a chance to make that happen, they, they want in. The, the only other thing I'll say about fundraising is that it's one of the more emotional tactics because it's not binary. You know, if you sign a petition, if you're motivated to sign a petition, you just do. Uh, if you decide to attend an event, you just attend. You don't super attend. Although, you can recruit friends or not, and that's the difference. But donation is, is one of those things where you donate, you might donate five rand, or 10 rand, or 1,000 rand, depending on how passionate you are. So really playing on emotions. Um, playing on sounds weird, but like engaging emotions is what I mean, is, is really important in the language, in, in the tactic. Um, and the more passionate you get people, well, there's a whole art and science to that which we don't have time to go into, but 
uh, those are the two points. Make it tactical, make it strategic. Remember that there's nothing dirty or wrong or weird about it, and it's not helping you any more than a petition is. That's the main thing to change, is the, is the, the NGO dynamic of give me money to do my job to go help the world. That's the fundamental shift with this. It's use your money as an additional way for you, us, collectively, to change the world together. And that, that actually, that dynamic is, is fundamental to what all this is about, because the traditional dynamic of we over here, the experts, are, are making the change in the world, and you give us your time, your money, or whatever, that's what people are used to. This whole participatory thing, to get people to participate at this level, the whole story changes. We collectively are making the change, and the money is just part of it. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, you didn't have a hand up? Okay. <laughs> I have two, two quick questions. The, the, the first is, a lot of the resources that you spoke about and like the tools online are not accessible to people at a grassroots level. They take a certain amount of technological skill, mm -hmm. know-how. The organization that I'm from, Equal Education, has you know, spent quite a lot of money um, working with, with people to, to pay for these kinds of re these tools. So it's a very practical question. You know. What are the kinds of resources that are out there that are easily available, that are accessible for grassroots organizations, for community organizations, mm -hmm. to do online organizing um, in a similar way to um, Obama for America or, or any of those kinds mm -hmm. of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know, for example, that Avaaz recently re re has a part of their website which now allows you to lead your own petition, but that's yeah. not really online, that's not really a um, very specific organizing thing. So I'm interested if there are any programs out there. And the second one is also a quite a practical question. As you alluded to in your, 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 your talk earlier, quite a lot of online organizing is having a bigger enough database so that when a percentage responds, if it's 10%, then it's a million as opposed to 100 people. Yeah. Now, Avaaz just went past 20 million people, and I'm interested to know what strategies were used by Avaaz to grow the amount of people they contact on a, on a regular basis, and specifically how you managed to strike the ba what, what the philosophy or, or the what you did basically to strike the balance between set, being enough in contact with people regularly enough so they would do things and attract more people, but not so much to annoy them and to make them not you know to click and follow or yeah, yeah, yeah. unsubscribe from yeah. your service. Yeah. Great questions. I want to also address one of the ones you asked earlier that I haven't answered yet. Um, I'll try to do this quickly. So the first one you asked earlier that I didn't address was uh, the persuasive potential for these media. How do you convince people, or can you, should you try to convince people of things they don't already believe versus move them on the things they do believe? I, I think it's a really good question, and, and I want to highlight here what I think is a, a limitation of digital organizing, which is that I don't think it is a good medium for persuasion. And the reason why is because I think that uh, as human beings, our natural instinct, when we encounter something that we think we disagree with, before we're willing to open our minds, and you guys tell me what you think about this, you know, this is my opinion. But I think that when we, when we hear something we disagree with, we're more likely to just dismiss it and think it's wrong because we disagree with it than we are to stop, pause, challenge our own assumptions, open our mind and be persuaded. I think the things that force us to change our minds about things where we really may have a value disagreement or even a factual disagreement is either extended exposure to just messaging over time. Like if you watch Fox News over and over again and you're told Obama's a socialist Muslim Kenyan who's going to kill your, grand your grandchildren, eventually, whether you believed it or not, you just kind of get beaten into it. So propaganda, large exposure over time. But that has to be pervasive, it's extremely well funded, it's very intense, and you have to not be able to avoid it for it to work. It has to just be in your face somehow as you walk through life. The other way is personal relationships. If you really know somebody, if you're face to face, and you hear somebody's story, you get to know someone you didn't know before and you really believe them, then that can open minds and change hearts. If you get an email and it contains an opinion you don't agree with or a fact you think is wrong, just flat out wrong and you don't believe the citation or whatever, you're just much more likely to click dismiss to, to, to close it than you are to be persuaded. So what I think the role of digital organizing is, is to uh, try to find the people in your society who already basically share your values and basically share your reality map who kind of see the basic lay of the land, how things work the way you do, and then to give them the tools, put the resources in their hands to be persuasion agents and ripple outwards. Because if you've got a million people on your email list, every one of them has friends that they can speak to, that they can challenge, they can bring along to them events, they can force them to sit down and watch a two-hour documentary, which really shoves facts in their faces. The thing that is anchoring them into the couch watching the documentary is in the email, it's their friend. And you're never going to have that power, but you can give people the documentary who already agree with you. You can give them the suggestion. You can give them the, the host pack so that they have the instructions. 
and then they do that. So I actually think that's a key thing, because a lot of times the way digital tools are misused is particularly when they're like put under the communications department of an organization, so people use them as if they were persuasion tools, to just throw arguments out there at the wall. And really, it's not a good use. You should, you should try to find, through action, the people who agree with you, give them the tools to be persuasion agents and, and, and influencers on, on power up and out. That's my belief. So moving on. Um, and by the way, I just want to also emphasize, this is one of the many reasons it's really important never to think that digital organizing, engaging en masse with large numbers of supporters through digital tools, should replace offline, traditional, local, relationship-based organizing. God forbid ever, never, never, never that should happen. And this is a huge part of why, because those structures are the ones where persuasion can happen uh, in a way that can't be done that way. So that's really important. Um, so let's see, your next point was tools that are available. Okay, so I'll just, you're, you're right, that a lot of the things I showed up here were hard to build, expensive to build. Your average grassroots group couldn't just throw them on your website tomorrow. But increasingly, a lot of these tools are available and at low prices. There's something called Nation Builder, which comes out of the States, which is a very uh, low cost option for doing a lot of the basic campaigning, aggregating, communicating stuff. There are tools now that were not available even just a couple years ago, something called SendGrid, for example, that allows you to manage even very large email lists. Um, and get all the kind of data that you need. Uh, and actually, one of the things that we're working on, I'm hoping this project that I'm helping some folks here, Zaki and, and, and X and, and others, to, to throw together, is uh, will, will lead to one of the more powerful platforms that was developed in Australia with one of the groups that we mentioned, become open source and translated particularly into the Global South context, which requires a greater integration with mobile phones, uh, text messaging, US SSD, voice, all those sorts of things. And uh, I'm currently living in Bangalore, working on one version of that. It's designed to work in the Indian market, and hopefully this will be an opportunity to do that in the South African market. Because I believe strongly that putting more of these tools much more cheaply in the hands, or for free, in the hands of more organizations is critical. So thank you for asking that, and we can, you can find me offline if you want more suggestions on what's already available in the marketplace. Your last question was, um, ah, growth, how to do it, and how to balance between annoying frequency, yeah. So Avaaz is interesting. Um, some of Avaaz's growth techniques I, I don't like, I, and I haven't actually actively been on staff for like elite in a long time. <laughs> yeah, and I think sometimes I do get annoying and a little bit too formulaic. I don't know how many of you are on the Avaaz list. Uh, so you know, 24 hours to save the whatever is probably a theme you're used to by now, uh, and it still tests well. But I think for people who pay attention, it gets to the point where it's like. God, Jesus, like I've heard so many times that 24 hours to save the rhino or the elephant or the children or the babies or whatever, and then I, you know, you probably don't hear back 24 hours later about what actually happened. And if you dig into it a lot of the time, it really work just 24 hours, it's just that was a nice way to get people out the email. I can't really recommend any of those techniques. I think they do alienate people over time. And part of why Voz needs to be so big is there's a big churn. And a lot of those 20 million are not very active anymore. So, you know, it's just to, it's sort of, I guess really why I say that is to highlight that, but also to think critically about the things that land in your inbox, even from the really big groups, and to know that there are trade-offs to all these things, and you're right to identify them. Um, in, in terms of the, how can I put this? I, I, when I do trainings on this, I talk about something I call the subject narrative, which is to say that generally somewhere between 90 and 70% of your list doesn't open most emails you send if you're a very large organization. In the early stages, your open rate should be, you know, be 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. But once you get very big, you've been going for a while, you're probably going to fall to around 20, 30, 15. So for most of the people, what they see is, is those subject narratives. And if, and if they're just this kind of repetitive, anxiety-producing mantras or tropes, you do start to tune out. So you want to think about how to keep that, that subject line stuff interesting, varied, and to tell a story that, that even brings people along a little bit. I have a slide I can show you where I, I go through a sample campaign of like, where there's a subject narrative here that walks you through a campaign for indigenous health, and it's like, here's the issue, and, and, and today we're writing email, or we're writing RMPs, and wow, 40,000 letters, and here's the response, and there's the vote, and then we won. You don't have to open any of those emails, and you get the whole story, and it's cathartic, and it's exciting. And then this one is just a bunch of kind of gimmicky, 24 hours to like, you wouldn't believe this, like, amazing blah, 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 and you go through all of that, and you don't have any idea what just happened. So it's kind of alienating. So one of my recommendations is, kind of irrespective of frequency, is to just keep your subjects interesting and meaningful, like put real content in them. Uh, in terms of frequency, though, I'll tell you this. I think it's 100% contextual. The Obama campaign went freaking insane uh, over the, in the last cycle. They literally were, in the last 
two months, sending, in many cases, upwards an average of four to five emails a day. A day. And here's the crazy part. I, along with a lot of other people, were getting this. I'm thinking, you people are out of your mind. You're alienating everyone. I can't even use my inbox in my life anymore. Like, I hate you. I want you to die. And I should be supporting you right now. But I literally want to throttle you. I literally couldn't find a frequency where there was a marginal decrease in the rate of return. So what I mean was, even on those days when they sent six emails, the sixth email did as well as the first email in that day. Now, I am not recommending this. <laughs> Unless your small grassroots NGO is running for president of the United States. In which case, you have a very special context. <laughs> but the reason I tell this story is because it illustrates how contextual this stuff is. If a normal organization did that, it would be very alienating. But even your organization, if there's a story that people get, see, the story people got about the election is that it was going to end soon, and that the whole world was on the line, and it was really close, and it mattered. And because they believe all of those things, they were willing to accept a lot of abuse in the two months leading up to the election. If they didn't know when it was going to end, if they didn't think it was so damn important, none of that would have worked. But you'll find moments that actually feel like that within your context. If you're organizing around education, there's a big vote, there's a big election, there's a big protest or, or walkout or something you're organizing, and people generally understand that time frame and understand the importance and believe it's going to end, you can actually get away with a lot more than you might think. And, you know, vice versa, if you aren't escalating in those moments, meaning being more frequent, giving people more things to do, giving them more frequent updates, you may actually undermine yourself by kind of not behaving appropriately. If, if your people think this is a huge moment, you should be acting like it's a huge moment. And then when the moment's over, you pause, you take a breath, you give them a breather. You know, during down times, you're not like that. So vary your behavior. A lot of people sometimes ask me about how often should you change topics on an email thread. Know, or an email list, like how, what confuses people. And I talk about the exploding trash can theory. So right now I'm talking to you guys, right, about this topic, online organizing. There's a trash can somewhere in the back. If it blew up right now, and I just sat here and kept talking to you about online organizing after the trash can, I was like, so, speaking of open rates, blah, 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 that would be really weird. A trash can just blew up over there, right? And you'd be like, holy shit, why did that trash can blow up? And that should be my next communication to you, because we all saw something that just happened that's a really big deal. So it's really important to change topics then. Similarly though, if I, in talking to you now, just change topics every other sentence, you wouldn't be getting anything coherent out of me. This would be a very alienating experience. Maybe it is anyway, it's gone on too long, but hopefully it's somewhat useful. But if I was just you know, changing topics about the weather, about my family, about animals I love, blah, 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 about the sad elephants that I want you to save, you would uh, get confused and alienated. It wouldn't be a real conversation either. So the rule of thumb here is have real conversations. And if something explodes in the background that your members are aware of, you know, you were building up to a big education moment, but then there's a, an awful high profile case of police brutality or sexual violence, and you know that's what's on people's minds. Change the topic. Talk about what people want to talk about. And then when that's resolved, you come back to what you were talking about before, just like you would in a real conversation with someone if the trash can is gone. And vice versa, if, not, if nothing's happening, you're having a conversation, have enough back and forth on a single topic to have a coherent exchange, where if you say 24 hours to save the elephants, you know, come back to people after 24 hours and say, what happened? And you know, explain why, because otherwise it just feels like you're constantly screaming and running around like a crazy person. And that's not a good relationship either, is it? Anyway, that's helpful. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, in the back. Um, so I'll just come late. You said that you faced down a competitor with a $500 million budget. Uh -huh. What, what did you have? 90 million. If you mean financially? Yeah. Well, someone said people, which is the right answer. But we, budget-wise, we had 90 million in that case. That, the fight I was referring to was the health reform fight in the... Yeah. Uh, so what, what is the minimum amount of money which you could fight 500 million with? That's a really interesting question. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to have a you know a magic line answer, but to break it down and just try to analyze it out loud with you, yeah. um, if you think about what the 500 million went for, they primarily spent it on ads, and you know this was an advocacy thing. This wasn't an election. This was this was advocacy and, and around a vote. And so the point of those ads was to twofold: one, move the needle of public opinion against health reform, but also scare members of Congress by blanketing the airways with ads. So members of Congress would just see the ads, they'd freak out that their constituents were seeing the ads, and then they'd be like, I can't do this because my constituents are seeing these ads. So it's kind of a game, it's like a shell game. 
It's like, who knows who's actually being persuaded or not, but I just know they're seeing all these ads. So I'm scared, so I won't do it. So what does it take to actually fight back against that? Well, one of the things that online organizing does is really cool is it allows you to do some jujitsu, where you actually need to spend a lot less to have a similar effect. So one technique I like a lot is called retargeting. So the way this works, you can run an ad on Facebook, let's say, target it to people who work for a specific company. Let's say, one good example of this has really happened, 1-800-Flowers uh, is a flower delivery company in the United States. There was an early campaign on change.org to get them to um, uh, fair trade sourced flowers. They didn't want to do it. And so what they did is they ran ads on Facebook to people who work at the 1-800-Flowers company. Because you know on Facebook you enter your employer network. So if you work for the 1-800-Flowers network, you saw this ad and it was very, I forget what exactly, like 1-800-Flowers, best company ever or something like that. It was like sort of cheeky, little a little innocuous, but it got a lot of people who worked at a click. They were the only ones who saw it. Then they, they went to the campaign page and said, get 1-800-Flowers. Now these people didn't fill out the, camp the campaign, they don't want to campaign against their company, but it put a cookie on their browser. I don't know if it's a technical term, I don't know if you guys know what that means. It's just a little thing that a computer uses. Spying. Well, tracking, spying, you know, but it basically, if you, if you go to certain websites, they'll put a little marker on your browser, your web browser, so they know you've been to that website, and that marker is visible to other players on the internet, other entities. So they put a cookie, and then, we ran a retargeting, so this is what retargeting means. So what you do is you run, you, you go to like ad networks that put ads, the kind of ads you see everywhere. If you go to the, you know, the Mail and Guardian or you go to FIFA or you, whatever website, if you just see ads on the sides, the top or whatever, those ads can be determined by what cookies you have in your browser. So if you've been to a site to look at baby products, you're more likely to see ads that are about baby products. Uh, you know. But in this case, we could pay uh, for thousands of ads to thousands of impressions for these ads that were about this campaign only going to people who had this cookie, meaning they had been there. And those were only people that had followed our Facebook ad uh, and that was targeted to the company. And we pay for those ads. You know, the way you pay for it is by how many times people click on them. Now, nobody was going to click on them because these ads were saying, tell 1-800-Flowers to use fair trade flowers. And the only people who are seeing those ads are employees of 1-800-Flowers or their immediate family. So they're not going to click because they don't want to do that. But they're seeing it everywhere. <laughs> and so they go to the New York Times. It is a giant banner ad at the top of the New York Times. Tell 1-800-Flowers to use one. No, no, no. They go to their. They go to the, the. They go to look at the, how the Boston Red Sox are doing. They go to their favorite sports team. And top of the thing. They you know whatever they they're shopping on Amazon.com. Top of the thing. And so it looks to them like the entire freaking internet has been bought up with these 1-800-Flowers ads. So that worked for about a week. Then, no, less than that, three days, three days. And then Change got a call from the CEO of the company who literally said, this is ridiculous. My wife and my daughter using my computer at home are seeing nothing but these 1-800-Flowers. What is this going to take? So they said, we'll sign this thing and do the thing. He was like, fine, screw it, fine. They did. They, they signed it. They made the agreement. They shifted their supplier arrangements. We won three days. You know how much we spent in total on that advertising campaign? $4.50. <laughs> <laughs> because it was based on clicks. That's because normally when people run those ads, the whole point is to get people to click on the ads and buy things or sign up. I didn't have $500 million. I've got a guy with $500 million and I want to know at what point do I just give up? Well, but so what I'm saying is if you think about, so take that same story and apply it to the healthcare fight. So they're spending $500 million in television ads, but you, what you're not going to be able to compete with is actually putting toe-for-toe -toe television ads on right? that. But if the point of those television ads, most of that point, is to convince Congress that their constituents are seeing all these ads, what I'm saying is you could spend you know, something much, much, much less and convince the right people with the right kind of targeted, clever ad strategy that their constituents are also seeing tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of your ads. Which So you could spend $100 and neutralize a million dollars worth of television advertising if you do it the right way. Now, it doesn't tell you where your magic line is, but it does tell you before you give up when you're being massively outspent, that there's a lot you can think through about where that money is going, how you can achieve a similar effect with much less with some of these techniques, and then other ways that you can use. So the you fight, well fight thing, this is the last thing I'll say on this. Did you see that where, where people pledge volunteer hours? Were you here for that part? So it, it, that number, 10 million volunteer hours, relatively easy to get. I forget how many people filled that out. 
it was a few thousand. It wasn't actually that many. But if you ask people a question like, how many hours are you so passionate that when the election comes in a year from now, how many hours do you volunteer per week for three months? You can do some math, and it's real, and there's real pledges, and you can go back to people with them. But it's much easier than you might think to get a 10 million volunteer hour pledge. So there's a lot of techniques from this world that can help you as a David beat a Goliath financially.